My presentation today is based on a book manuscript that I'm in the process of revising, uh, which is tentatively titled Resistance, Repression, Responsiveness, Workers and Change in China. I might just call it Workers and Change in China because the uh, alliteration is a little bit of overkill. The uh, project has its roots in some of my earliest experiences in China. Um, as Professor Duby suspected, I taught for a period at an agricultural university in rural Shanxi <coughs> province. And when I was there, I came across this protest by employees at a luxury hotel. When I went over and talked to them, they explained that they're angry about a corporate takeover of their company and worried about their jobs. They're demanding that the government investigate and resolve their issues. Now, aside from a few scrappy uh, labor NGOs, uh, similar to worker centers here in the United States uh, serving immigrants, China only has one official, stuffy, Communist Party controlled trade union federation, the All China Federation of Trade Unions, uh, which has as its explicit mandate maintaining industrial peace. The union would be little or no help in an incident like the one I witnessed at the hotel. Nonetheless, in the about decade and a half since then, um, incidents like this have become commonplace, leading some scholars to describe China as an emerging epicenter and even as undeniably the epicenter of global labor unrest. China doesn't release official strike statistics, but unofficial counts, including my own, something I'll come back to later in the presentation, show a steady upward trajectory in numbers of workplace conflicts. Several of these conflicts have captured international headlines. This is maybe the most famous one, a work stoppage by Honda Auto Parts plant employees in Nanhai, Guangdong in 2010 that shut down the company's entire Chinese supply chain and led to other similar actions at other Honda, Hyundai, and Toyota plants. Here's a taxi strike in Chongqing in 2008 that spread to over a dozen cities around the country. These pictures show a violent protest that blocked the privatization of a steel mill in Jilin province in 2009 and inspired an equally successful anti-privatization effort at a mill in Henan the same year. And here finally is a mobilization by an estimated 40,000 shoe factory workers in Dongguan, Guangdong in uh, 2014 that's thought to have been the largest single industrial action uh, since the 1949 revolution. The state's reactions uh, to these conflicts have been mixed, ranging from uh, union thugs beating up strikers in Nanhai in 2010, to the municipal party secretary negotiating with striking cab drivers on live television in Chongqing in 2008, to police raids paired with forced company concessions in Dongguan in 2014. Nationally, the government has passed sweeping new labor laws, even as it's further reduced the political space available to labor NGOs. And more broadly, scholars have offered a clashing interpretations of China's political development trajectory. Uh, portraying the country as trapped, as increasingly responsive, and as um, reverting to an authoritarianism uh, redolent of its past. So my project, I'm asking what effect, if any, is worker organizing having in the end on Chinese governance? Or put differently, what does it all add up to? Uh, the question might be simple, but I think it's important because it speaks to the power of ordinary people in difficult circumstances. It's also relatively underexplored in the literature. So in the remainder of my presentation, I'll uh, briefly review that literature. I'll lay out my own theory of the change underway in China's workplaces. I'll explain my data sources and walk you through two case studies and a short statistical analysis. I'll talk about some remaining issues uh, dealt with by the project and I'll finish by exploring some of its implications. So one reason my topic might be underexplored uh, may be an overemphasis in the literature on issues of regime stability versus collapse. So 
So since the 1990s, a transitology paradigm, uh, which treated authoritarian regimes as just a way station on the inevitable path to democracy, has uh, been replaced by a paradigm of authoritarian resilience, which has shifted academic attention to fine-grained typologies of authoritarian regimes and to the mechanisms that autocrats possess for maintaining control. Missing in both lines of analysis, I'd argue, is attention to the gradual changes in governance that can occur outside of democracies. Social movement scholars, meanwhile, have tended to be more excited about the causes of movements than their outcomes. So too often, uh, activism has been treated as only a dependent variable, in other words. There are, of course, uh, substantial obstacles arrayed against a more outcomes-oriented approach, including the difficulty of defining movement success and failure, of disentangling the impact of movements from that of other challenges to governments, and accounting for preemptive repression, and for the anticipation of repression, and for the anticipation of preemptive repression, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but whereas some progress has nonetheless been made toward understanding the impact of activism in the context of liberal democracies, uh, next, no research has been conducted on movement outcomes under authoritarianism. Research on Chinese contentious politics has actually gone a little bit further in this regard, and scholars have identified several successful activist strategies, including rightful resistance, using the Chinese Communist Party's rhetoric against it, essentially, uh, troublemaking, those are small, disruptive acts that go right up to the line of what the party will tolerate, but not over it, uh, drawing on wide social networks, and roping in policy entrepreneurs, including local officials. But with a few uh, important exceptions, most of this research has focused on the determinants of wins versus losses in individual showdowns, and as such, it's held the system as a whole constant, and it's missed broader patterns of bottom-up change. So in contrast, my project examines a broad, a movement-led, or maybe more accurately, a proto-movement-led uh, process of change within authoritarian rule, but as I'll explain, uh, change of a very mixed sort for activists and authorities alike. So I argue that as an autocracy, uh, China can't afford spirals of anti-regime preference revealing or preference change. Uh, that is, uh, people stepping forward in front of their neighbors and declaring their opposition to the government, or alternately, uh, themselves moving from a position of support to one of opposition. And it can't pass the buck to sensibly neutral institutions like uh, courts or labor relations boards or, of course, elections. As a post-state socialist autocracy uh, in particular, China is hobbled uh, additionally by hollow trade unions. We already mentioned these earlier an especially transparent fusing of economic and political power. Now, and I'm not saying they're the only ones that fuse economic and political power, just that they do so especially transparently. And a founding ideology that emphasizes egalitarianism and throws their current inequalities into especially sharp relief. So for all these reasons, uh, China takes worker resistance extremely seriously. And this concern is transmitted downward, level by level, to local officials in the form of bureaucratic incentives to demonstrate to their superiors that they're on top of things when confronted with rising unrest. Demonstrating that they're on top of things, in turn, uh, generates distinct local models of control. These models interact, diffuse, and they add up, on average, to increase state repressive capacity on the one hand, and increased state responsive capacity on the other. I argue that in the short term, this kind of dual strengthening is complementary. So repression puts an outer bound on how far the resistance, responsiveness, opportunity spiral can run, and responsiveness uh, takes some of the sting out of repression. Uh, but in the long run, I argue they're contradictory. Uh, repression undercuts the trust built by responsiveness, and responsiveness encourages the very activism that repression was meant to deter. And the result is the lurching, uneven form of political development we've seen in China over the last couple of decades. To document these dynamics, I draw on a variety of data sources. 
So first of all, uh, to measure worker resistance, I rely on a collection I put together of 1,471 strikes, protests, and riots by Chinese workers between the years 2003 and 2012, or basically the Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao administration. This collection, uh, which I've dubbed uh, China Strikes, is based on state media, social media, uh, and the websites of advocacy groups. It's publicly available online, so I've put the URL for it here at the top of the page. And visitors to my website uh, can read detailed reports on each of the incidents in the data set. They can also submit information on any incidents that they know of that I've missed uh, using this handy upload form shown, form shown here. I've checked China Strikes against another a similar project started after mine uh, by the Hong Kong-based advocacy group China Labor Bulletin from 2011 up to present, uh, adding any incidents that CLB captured that I missed for the two years that our data sets overlap. And finally, I've asked the research assistant to recheck each year of China Strikes using a fixed set of websites and keywords, and I put those websites and keywords up here for you to look at. This slide, uh, which is similar to one I showed you earlier, uh, shows the China strikes count in red, alongside uh, the CLB count here in dotted black. A surprisingly low ball, or maybe not so surprisingly, low ball count by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences down here in blue. And officially uh, reported mass incident numbers these were sporadically released on an annual basis up until the year 2005 and then were no longer uh, made public. Over here uh, in green on the left, uh, but counted over here on the right uh, y-axis. As you can see, not only uh, do strikes and protests and riots appear to be increasing, but they seem to be becoming more ambitious in their aims. So the red line right here shows the number of incidents featuring demands for higher wages, and the dotted orange line above it shows the percent of incidents featuring demands for higher wages. That is, not demands for uh, the legal minimum wage, not demands for wage arrears, not demands uh, for uh, legally mandated severance packages or compensation for work injuries, but just demands for more full stop. To capture how governance is changing in the face of this rising resistance, I draw on uh, various statistical yearbooks uh, put out by the Chinese state and uh, local government almanacs. The latter are uh, glossy volumes, sort of trumpeting various uh, local achievements um, that are frequently given as gifts to visiting delegations from higher levels of government. And as such, I think they provide a unique window into the pressures that local authorities feel to impress their superiors. And finally, uh, to get a sense of the qualitative differences in policy that exist uh, between different places in China, I draw on a total of about 152 interviews with almost 200 uh, labor activists, workers, government officials, factory managers, and others. Uh, between 2011 and 2017, but really concentrated in 2014 and 2015. And the first form that my analysis takes is a pair of most similar case studies. And the cases I choose, and this is uh, uh, captured in the uh, article that Professor Duby mentioned, are uh, Guangdong's portion of the Pearl River Delta, or the PRD, shown here at the top, and um, uh, Jiangsu's portion of the Yangtze River Delta, or the YRD, shown here at the bottom. These pictures are actually a little bit unfair, uh, because at least in my experience, uh, the PRD is much less polluted than the YRD, because for whatever reason, it's easier for airborne particulate matter to blow out to sea from Guangdong than it is from Jiangsu. At any rate, uh, the YRD is located here on China's central coast, inland from Shanghai. And the PRD is located uh, down in the southeast across from Hong Kong. The two regions are, of course, not carbon copies of each other, but they're arguably more alike than any other two parts of China, at least with regard to several factors 
uh, traditionally treated as important in studies of Chinese labor issues. So here you can see the PRD's uh, Guangdong and the YRD's Jiangsu ranked relative to all of China's 31 provinces, directly administered cities and autonomous regions on those factors. So GDP, GDP per capita, exports, FDI, number of migrant workers. And some other versions I throw in SOEs here too. You'll notice uh, that the two provinces are never more than three notches apart in these rankings. And on three of the five measures, they trade first and second place. Nonetheless, they differ dramatically when it comes to their levels of worker resistance. This slide, which is based again on my China strikes data set, shows average annual strikes per capita for again all of China's provinces, directly administered cities, and autonomous regions. And you'll notice that the PRD's Guangdong is clearly far and away the leader, uh, whereas the YRD's Jiangsu ranks somewhere in the middle. So what's the practical impact of this kind of difference in militancy? Well, unrest puts tremendous pressure on local officials, as illustrated by uh, quotes like these from my interviews. So a government researcher in Nanjing said to me, officials are judged as much or more on stability as they are on economic development. It doesn't matter how much you grow the economy, if you have a lot of big incidents, that cancels out your economic achievements. Meanwhile, a labor bureau official in Tianjin said to me, uh, why do officials care? Well, every year the city will review their reports. Officials from different places will just have to sit there, not be able to say anything while the city notes where the officials have done well or badly. That is, well or badly with regard to their uh, dealing with various incidents. This puts a lot of pressure on people. And this pressure isn't some sort of free-floating, amorphous anxiety. It has very concrete career consequences. This slide uh, shows membership turnover on the politics and law committees, which are responsible for maintaining social order, in uh, Shenzhen, in the tumultuous PRD here in yellow, and Suzhou in the relatively uh, quiescent YRD. You notice that the committees in both cities uh, follow more or less the same political cycle, um, but the swings are much more dramatic in Shenzhen than in Suzhou. And the result, I argue, of this kind of constant bureaucratic churn is powerful uh, strains on local officials in high unrest places like Shenzhen to demonstrate to their superiors that they're on top of things just to keep their jobs. So in this slide, you can see that as uh, labor disputes have grown in the Pearl River Delta compared to the Yangtze River Delta, this graph over here on the left, uh, mentions of uh, labor issues in the public security sections of local government almanacs. These again are these volumes that are given out uh, to visitors from Beijing or wherever, uh, have also grown in an apparent bid uh, by local authorities to show that they're uh, in charge of the situation. So worker resistance works through bureaucratic incentives to have its effect. And if there's a sort of broad regime level logic to the change underway in China's workplaces, there's also logic situated at the level of local governments, local officials, and sort of mundane water cooler politics. To show the qualitative differences in governance that are the result of this, I draw on my uh, interviews and show how in the moderate unrest uh, Yangtze River Delta officials have taken an approach to managing workplaces that can be characterized as preemption, caution, and nudging, whereas in the high unrest Pearl River Delta, they've taken an approach that can be characterized as reaction, experimentation, and crackdowns. Uh, specifically, a Yangtze River Delta officials carefully monitor workplaces, nipping burgeoning disputes in the bud, but they just pass the most incremental local labor laws that tweak existing national level regulations and allow their branches of the State Control Union Federation to tend to old state socialist era welfare functions. Yangtze River Delta businesses are coaxed into line with things like a harmonious enterprises initiative, and labor NGOs in the region are given government office space and quietly steered clear of politically sensitive programming. In contrast, 
In the high unrest Pearl River Delta, the government doesn't try to head off each and every dispute. There are just too many of them for it to even try. And it saves its energy instead for when things seem to be spiraling out of control. At the same time, though, it's passed pioneering labor laws in recent years that have come close to recognizing a right to strike. And it supported, uh, especially since the 2010 Honda strike I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, it supported uh, the direct election of enterprise level trade union chairs. This is something uh, long provided for by Chinese law but rarely put into practice. And it's backed exercises that come a little bit closer to approximating what we think of as collective bargaining. At the same time, though, it's come down hard on Chinese uh, labor activists, uh, jailing the heads of several uh, prominent labor NGO leaders, uh, first in 2015 and then more recently just in January of this year. And increasingly, in very high profile conflicts, it's uh, beaten and detained ordinary striking workers. So to give you a little more of a flavor of what I'm talking about, I'll read you several quotes from the two regions. So capturing this contrast I make between preemption on the one hand and reaction on the other, in the moderate unrest Yangtze River Delta, a labor NGO staffer said to me, it's not that there aren't disputes, the government just tries to mediate everything quickly. There's a lot in people's hearts here, but it never gets to rise to the surface. In contrast, in the high unrest Pearl River Delta, a trade union leader said to me, now strikes are normal. The government can't direct everything here. Capturing this contrast between caution on the one hand uh, versus experimentation on the other then, in the moderate unrest Yangtze River Delta, a labor official had this to say about the local legislative process. Our work style is the first look, second move slow, and third only later put something through. In contrast, uh, China Labor Bulletin had this to say about Guangdong's draft law on the democratic management of enterprises. Once this local level legislation has been passed, we think it could trigger a major overhaul of the collective consultation system that's prevailed in China over the last couple decades. Again, capturing this contrast between caution on the one hand, experimentation on the other. In the moderate unrest Yangtze River Delta, a trade union leader said to me, because the enterprise doesn't have a lot of grievances, the union doesn't do much rights protection work. Instead, it focuses on creating entertainment and health facilities for workers. It has a cultural center with a gym. In contrast, in the high unrest Pearl River Delta, a trade union leader said to me, the workers have been taught how to express their demands uh, by the union. They often say, I want a higher wage. Okay, but which part of your wage do you want to raise? Your hourly rate or your year end bonus? And what are you willing to give up for this raise? This kind of language might sound a little bit condescending to you, uh, but in the context of China's trade union, it is actually quite progressive. And then capturing this contrast between nudging on the one hand and crackdowns on the other, in the moderate unrest Yangtze River Delta, an NGO leader said to me, work for my organization is slowly getting better. People didn't fully understand organizations like this at first, but now the government's uh, supportive. And this leader uh, had her offices actually in a, a local uh, neighborhood council building. In contrast, in the high unrest Pearl River Delta, an NGO leader said to me, I was just forced to move my home again. They can't find my office, so they make me move my home. In fact, I don't really have much of an office anymore. And this person kept all of their belongings in big plastic bins, so when the police arrived, it would be easy to move. And in the past year, they'd had to move 13 times. Finally, and I swear these are the last uh, quotes I'll be reading to you, in the moderate unrest Yangtze River Delta, a protesting worker uh, at a factory in Jiangjiagang uh, said to me, Yes, they, meaning the government, have been a big help. Uh, they're hunting for the owner who ran away. And she expressed this confidence uh, despite the fact that she and her co-workers had, had just had to block a major intersection in their town. And when I met them, they were standing around the guardhouse of their empty factory in the rain. In contrast, in the high unrest Pearl River Delta, a protesting worker, uh, this time at a handbag factory in uh, Zhongshan, uh, said to me, uh, we were told to choose representatives for bargaining, but then all the representatives, more than 10 people were detained. They were just pushed into vans. Uh, by the time I got to this factory to interview people, they'd already been on strike uh, for a month with no resolution in sight. 
So to recap, a worker resistance works through bureaucratic incentives to generate distinct regional models of control. I'll finish up by using a short statistical analysis to show you how these regional models of control interact, diffuse, and add up on average to more investment in tools of repression, that is more uh, repressive capacity on the one hand, and a greater ability to respond to worker grievances or more responsive capacity on the other hand. And here I'll be borrowing a little bit uh, from this paper uh, that just came out in China Quarterly. So to measure repressive capacity, I use spending on the paramilitary People's Armed Police, or PAP. This is a force uh, dedicated to containing large-scale uh, public disturbances and doesn't generally deal with day-to-day -day crime fighting. As you can he see here, uh, spending on the PAP has grown recently, uh, whether measured in terms of the central government spending or spending by uh, regional governments. To measure responsive capacity, uh, admittedly a trickier uh, concept to operationalize uh, quantitatively, I use uh, the outcomes of employment disputes brought to mediation, arbitration, and court. So more such formally adjudicated employment disputes decided fully in workers' favor, or at least in a split manner, indicates to my mind a greater capacity on the part of local authorities to overcome the objections of powerful local employers and uh, respond to grassroots grievances. Here you can see uh, that uh, formally adjudicated employment disputes of all types have risen over the last decade. After all, um, uh, the total number of disputes has risen, but uh, probe worker decisions uh, here in red and split decisions in dotted orange have far outstripped pro-business decisions. So to get at how uh, uh, resistance and repressive and responsive capacity interact, I estimate four uh, cross-sectional time series models with change in spending on the people's armed police or in the number of cases aside in a pro-worker split or pro-business manner as my four dependent variables and change in the number of strikes, protests, and riots drawn again on my China strikes data set as my main independent variable. I use changes in these variables because a Fisher type unit root <coughs> test found evidence of non stationarity in the series, which is just an elaborate way of saying that there are secular increases in the series that might lead us to infer some sort of relationship between them where there, in fact, was none. I choose to situate my analysis at the level of provinces. Uh, first of all, because with China's soft centralization of the late 1990s and early 2000s, more power. Uh, has become concentrated at that level, and also, and maybe more importantly, because more official data is simply available for provinces than it is for counties or townships or lower levels of government. I won't get into my controls right now, uh, but I'm happy to explain them during the Q&A. So in the coefficient plots, uh, I'm about to show you the standardized uh, coefficients of my various uh, uh, variables will show up with 95% confidence intervals around them as sort of horizontal bands. And the ones uh, with these horizontal bands to the right of this vertical zero line will have some sort of positive relationship with either repressive capacity, uh, captured again by people's armed police spending, or responsive capacity, uh, captured again by pro-worker or split decisions in mediation, arbitration, and court. Those to the left will have a negative relationship with those outcomes, and those that cross this uh, zero line will not be statistically significantly different from zero. In other words, they'll be insignificant. So as you can see, strikes are uh, positively and significantly uh, correlated with both increased repressive capacity and increased state uh, responsive capacity. In fact, an increase of one uh, strike in my data set is, I believe, uh, correlated with an increase of 96 more cases decided fully in workers' favor in a given province and 67 more uh, decided in a split manner. But there's no uh, statistically significant relationship with pro-business decisions. So to check whether some sort of bias in reporting is 
driving these results. You know, some part of the country having more open media, thinking of Guangdong here, of course, or some other part of the country having uh, more or less access to the internet. Uh, I uh, add in provincial fixed effects and rerun my regressions and I get the exact same results. And to check whether there's reverse causality at work, I use something called an Ariano bond estimator, which includes a lag dependent variable and instruments on the past values of the independent variable. And it finds uh, some evidence of a feedback effect for pro-worker and split decisions. In other words, more such decisions um, encourage more workers to take to the streets. But it finds a strong negative relationship between uh, strikes and pro-business decisions. And finally, uh, just to check if a few sort of outliers are, are um, driving my findings, I drop especially influential observations, so observations with 50 or more strikes per province year, and I get the same results. In other words, uh, my findings are robust to a number of different model specifications. And it seems that increased uh, resistance yields both increased repression and responsiveness, or maybe more accurately, increased repressive and responsive capacity, and overall, a contradictory strengthening of the state. So to the ongoing uh, scholarly debate over whether China's uh, progressing or regressing, or whether it's becoming more open to various popular demands or more closed, uh, my answer is yes. It's doing all these things at once, and in the process, it's generating new opportunities and new challenges for activists and authorities alike. Uh, a couple of remaining issues dealt with by the project, uh, not all of which will be covered by the book. Um, first of all, I dig into the causes of regional variation and protests in the first place, um, and find uh, that various uh, structural factors, unsurprisingly, are responsible for more or less uh, protests in a place, but don't find that these fundamentally uh, confound the protest policy relationship. Here you can see uh, strikes, the little dots overlaid on uh, migrant worker density in the Pearl River Delta, represented by darker or lighter uh, counties. I also look at the diffusion of both protests and countermeasures against protests. And look at whether uh, especially uh, influential politicians at a regional level might have a sort of outsized role in determining what the local uh, model of control is. I find that these people matter, uh, but they don't matter as much as events on the ground. This research has, I think, a few uh, important implications. First of all, in contrast to both the um, transitology and uh, resilience paradigms in the study of authoritarianism. Change in autocratic rule short of regime change happens and is worth studying. And social movements have an impact outside of democracies. Uh, broad shifts in governance, not just the wins and losses and individual disputes that have been the focus of uh, studies of Chinese contentious politics up until now are observable. And autocracies are maybe best understood as nesting regimes within regimes. A protest builds the state's capacity, uh, but it also profoundly warps it. Maybe most basically, uh, my research cautions against an overly linear understanding of political change, and it gives us reasons for both optimism and pessimism regarding uh, China's future. So thank you so much, and I look forward to your comments and questions.